Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm pastor teacher Curtis Omo, and today we're going to continue our study in the book of wisdom we call Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 26. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we're right with the Lord by confessing our known sins. That means we name our sins that we know that we have done since the last time we confessed. And also, we want to give ourselves over the Spirit of God so we can get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity, for all that you have given us so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and our minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue in the sayings of the wise. Now, we know that's generally what the whole book of Proverbs is, but when the really smart people, let's put it this way, the scholars decided to divide this up and make it easier for us to memorize or we might say categorize, sort them out, they put this section in called Further Sayings of the Wise. And what this is, is just a bunch of sayings of the wise that are, of course, very effective, but they're not in any particular order. They go from one subject to the next. So it's sort of what we call random. So we move from, if you remember last lesson, the correct judging in the courts. We want fairness in the courts to now we talk about correct speaking. People need to say the right thing, to be honest. And that begins in verse 26. Rather strange way, though, listen to this. He kisses the lips, the one who gives an honest answer. Now remember, we're talking about these writings that we see here were originally written a couple of thousand years, actually about 3,000 years ago in the ancient world, in another language, and another culture. Kissing the lips was more frequent of other people than what we have today. Usually we restrict that, at least in the United States, to uh, the one we're married to, or maybe parents will kiss their children, or it'll be an aunt or a grandmother, someone really close. But in the ancient world, it meant other things besides between a man and a woman or a young to young people it and it indicated that the relationship was one of loyalty uh, a friendship um, someone close as an expression of well you're a partner with me in something we've made a deal a covenant and the idea of affection and bond is there also. There's a bond between us. So in the ancient world, kissing the lips was equivalent to giving an honest answer. And that's what this is here. If you ever study ancient history, you'll find out that customs were so different in different parts of the world at different times. Kissing was one of those. Uh, even uh, officers in the military in the Persian army, they could kiss each other on the lips. That's right. If they were the same rank, that was a way of greeting. If they were lesser rank, they might kiss them on the cheek. If they were even a lesser rank than that, they would bow. Of course, we don't do that today, and I don't know any culture that does, but understand this is a cultural thing. Uh, kissing has always been a sign of intimacy, as long as I know. And uh, that's what we have here. It's a close relationship, and it indicates you're going to be honest. So here it's used in comparison, to, in comparison to an honest answer. So it's basically saying a wise person is honest, and you want honest people around you, right? You don't want people lying or deceiving. So it's a valuable thing to have honest people around you. No deception. Uh, no hidden facts that you should know, no distortion of the truth. 
In verse 27, we go from good speaking, good honest communication to work. Now listen to this. This is an important lesson, especially for young people. It tells us a pattern that God has established in this world for building a home. Now remember, we have a father addressing a son, or we could say a wise person, a sage, S-A-G-E, addressing a student. So either way you take it is something we need to hear. So let's listen to it like we're a student or we're the son. Establish your work outside and prepare for yourself in the field and afterward, afterward, then build your house. Now, this is really simpler than I think it, it probably looks. Remember in those days, they usually worked outside. They worked in the fields. They had their farms, and they'd work in the fields with their crops, whatever it may be, whether it be wheat or maybe they did vineyards. We'll see vineyards later on. But whatever they raised out in the field, uh, that was what they did. That's where they worked. So basically, this is saying, do your work outdoors. Do your outdoor work. All right. Now, today, your parents may work in an office. That's fine. Or some sort of uh, sales floor. Or they may go house to house. Whatever it is, it's outside your home, usually. Now, they can work at home, but that's not the point here. The point here is that you want to do your work. You want to establish yourself in your job. So it says, and prepare for yourself in the field. So you are getting something ready for you. What would that be? Well, you sell your crops, you make some money. Or you sell whatever product you have, and you make some money. You put it in today's terms. You go out and get a job, whether it be an office building or even outside, maybe you work outdoors somehow. Maybe you're a forest ranger or you, you do have a farm and you work a lot outside. You run a tractor, plow the field, plant the seeds, fertilize it as you need it, and pray that the Lord will provide you the right amount of rain and sunshine to grow your crop. But either way, whether you work outdoors like that, you build yourself up an income, and a solid job. This is why it's important that whatever you do as a young person, you get ready for being an older person and an adult. You get your education. You get your training. I'm not telling everybody to go to college. I wouldn't do that today. College is pretty messed up in many places. You have to be real careful. So is any public education. So you got to be careful about your training. So you get your right training, you get your education, and you go out into the world and you make some money. Maybe you have an older brother or sister that's done that already. Uh, your parents probably did it. They can talk to you about that. And after you've done that, afterward, notice in our verse, afterward, then build a house. Now this means go out and get a place to live in. You may have a little apartment in the meantime while you're working, or maybe even stay with your parents, or wherever you can, or you have roommates. But after you have built up your job and made some money and established yourself, then go out and get a house. And this also includes building a household, which means you start a family. If you want to get married, you get married. You may have children. But this is basically telling us this is how God has set it up for the human race. You get a job, you get yourself established first. All right? It's pretty simple. Let's just kind of sum this up. First of all, you have to work. So before that, okay, let's get back up here. You may be a student. You may go to school. Or you go from some sort of training to become skilled at something, you become a plumber, a fireman, a carpenter, an electrician, okay, or you go into business, okay, that requires probably some school, and then you get into a business and they train you some more. But anyway, this is first, and then you go to work, right? You build up some money, you get established, and then you start a house 
which becomes your home. And when you get established, at some point, you'll want to move out of your house. It may come right after school or uh, a little further after that. But anyway, that's up to you and your parents and your situation. You can't be telling people exactly what to do here. But this is the general pattern. All right. As a young person, you get your training, which is what Proverbs does. It helps train young people. You go out, you know how the world works, you work, you get your job, and then you can build a home. You don't want to get this ahead of everything. You don't want to get one ahead of the other because you want to make sure that you have the money or you're on your own before you try to start your own home. Now, again, this is not real strict. You may want to expand the house you're in and have a property where you can build your own place and it's not very common today, but uh, children can live with their parents, even grown children with their own families. But uh, that's more in the ancient world. You don't see that too much today. But this is not saying you can't do that. But what this is saying is you work and then you build your house. Don't try to build a house without knowing how to work. You're not going to have the money. You get yourself in debt by borrowing money, and you don't want to do that either. Pretty simple proverb. A lot of people don't follow it, though. That's one reason we have things like this, because people have a tendency sometimes to just say, well, I just want I just want a new car. Well, how are you going to pay for it? I don't know. I'll borrow the money. Well, how are you going to pay the loan? Well, I never thought about that. You see, that would be foolish. So there's a lot of application here. You make a plan for your life. Everyone should have a plan. At a certain point, you want to have a plan. Now, you may change your plan, but at least it gives you a direction in life. I wanted to be certain things when I was in junior high. And then when I got to high school, I wanted to be something else. And then I got to college. I even changed my mind when I was in college. Because you see things you'd rather be than what you're training for. And that's fine. So do you find out what you want to be, though, the better, because you can always get trained longer and get in that job, but you just don't know. Sometimes the Lord will lead you different ways. I, I didn't know whether I was going to be in the ministry until I got out of the Marines. So I'd been to college, I'd been to the Marines, and then I got out of the Marines, and then a year or two later, I realized I want to be a pastor teacher. And that's because that's where God gifted me. And that's part of the program also. As you get older, you realize what God has given you the ability to do and then if it's a spiritual gift, you need to practice and put into uh, practice, then you need to train for that. Like I went off to seminary to train in the languages and train how to teach the Bible. Okay? So that's where I am today. And I have a house and a home. I don't own the house, but it's a house that we call our own. Uh, we pay for it every month. Okay? So that's the order of events in your life. You get your school, you get your training, and then you go on to build a home. Verse 28, we go to being honest in our speech again, but this has to do with a courtroom. Okay, let's move this out of the way. Here we go. Do not be a witness against your neighbor for no good reason, and do not deceive with your lips. Now, these are simple instructions. Now, this happens to be like a, a, a legal situation. Maybe you don't like your neighbor. Maybe he has a dog that barks too loud all the time, and you want to get back at him, or he, he did something to you and your property that you don't like, and you can't do anything about it, so now you want to do something towards him. You want to go to court and lie about him. That's what this is saying. Do not be a witness against your neighbor for no reason. You make something up. Well, he has been stealing my, my trees or my plants or my crops or something like that, if you keep in the agricultural uh, analogy. He's been taking my land. He's been moving in on it. And then... The fact is, that never really happened. It also says, do not deceive with your lips. In other words, be honest. Don't do that to your neighbor. Pretty simple, right? 
um, to you, a young person, don't lie to a teacher about another student. All right, just to get back at them. That would be the idea, that type of thing. Sometimes in sports, for example, we have people who often cheat. Today, unfortunately, cheating has become part of many games. If you can get away with it, it's okay. But you know it's cheating, and that's wrong, and you know it's wrong. When I was young and we played sports, we ha we didn't have umpires or referees out there. We were on referees and umpires, and we were just honest with each other. We knew if we were out of bounds. We knew if we fouled somebody playing basketball, right? And you could much tell, pretty much tell if someone is safe or out just between the two people who were involved on playing baseball. So your own referees, well, this is uh, another time. We live in another day and when cheating is often part of the game. They even say it's competitive. It's part of the competition. If you can get away with doing this, then you do it. No. You know, if you think about it, if everyone cheats, then that changes the game, doesn't it? That changes the rules. You're breaking the rules so often, why even have rules? I think as a young person, one of the ways I learned not to cheat, or let me put it this way, I learned that you can't cheat is if you play a board game. Because it's right there in front of everybody. And if you try to cheat, everybody will look at you and go, what are you doing? Right? So you don't want to make cheating part of your life either. And that's what this is. As you get older, you make it part of your life. So you're going to cheat your neighbor. You're going to lie about them. We see this with grown-ups. If you ever watch the news, people are always taking people to court for something. Corrupt businesses have corrupt lawyers. Corrupt politicians have corrupt people who work for them, right? So this is pretty much all over, and this is very damaging to society. One of our objectives here is to train you to make sure you understand the importance of being honest. Not only honest with people, but be honest about people. That's what this last verse had to do with. Don't take someone to court just to lie about them. This is all very damaging to our communities and our society. Young people who lie will grow up to be old people who lie and just hurt people. And that is what we call evil. And now listen, just because everyone else is doing it, does not make it right or that you should do it. Verse 29 builds on verse 28, where it talks about avoiding your own personal retaliation, or we might say vengeance. Do not say, I shall do the same to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back according to his conduct. Now, this is just the opposite of what we often call the golden rule. Uh, uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's not quite what the Bible says, but it's pretty close. Basically, you love your neighbor. You love yourself. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's kind of the idea behind it. So here it says, let's break it down. Do not say. All right, this is a command. I shall do the same to him as he's done to me. So he's hurt you, he's wronged you, and you're going to wrong them. Now, maybe this was something they took you to court in, and they lied about you, and they got away with it. Well, that doesn't mean you turn around and lie about them, right? You put that kind of situation in God's hands. The thinking is, is it has in the second line, I will pay the man back according to his conduct. In other words, I'm going to do justice on my own. Now listen, in many situations, that's not something you should do at all. Now the Bible does teach that when somebody does something wrong, that they're to be punished for that wrong. However, that doesn't mean the one who is wronged, that would be us in this case, is the one to punish the person who did the wrong, right? That's pretty simple, really. So 
as you grow up and you get older, it may mean that if someone stole something from you or cheated you in business, uh, you may have to take them to court. All right, that's a legal thing. And that's what the law takes care of. But even on a smaller scale, as someone cheats you or somehow lies about you, that doesn't mean you do the same thing to them. You still be honest. You still do the right thing. The difficult thing about applying this is you have to have a real situation, and you'll have plenty of those where you'll have to make decisions about people who's maybe lied about you on your job or took credit for something that you did. That can happen now. Someone does something perhaps with fellow students and they get the credit and you're the one that did the work. It doesn't make you very happy. But sometimes you just have to leave those situations in the Lord's hands. Now, if you get older and it happens on a bigger scale, like someone wants to take your property, you may have to take them to court. That's fine. They may try to cheat you out of property. Okay? Uh, but you take them to court, and if the court's just, that's why we always want to have just rulers. We want to put just judges in the court system. All right? Uh, then we get a good ruling. Don't give up on the court system. Even if, even if it gets totally corrupt, you have to trust the Lord and pray that things will work out. And God will deal with corrupt people. We've already seen about uh, blessing those who are righteous and just and then letting those who are not, we put them in God's hands and maybe God will curse them and deal with them his way. He's perfect at that. So if you've been wronged, and it's not a legal thing. Be patient. Trust the Lord. Listen to what the Old Testament believers were told to do. From Leviticus 19.18 You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your people. That's, that's your fellow Israelites. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's your golden rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Treat them the way you want to be treated. And if they treat you wrong, let the supreme, all-knowing, and all-powerful God deal with them. Another proverb. We studied this one earlier. Let's just go to Proverbs 20:22. 20, Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will avenge you. Now, young folks, this is one you really need to remember. The Lord will avenge you if you've been treated in an evil way. Our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about this subject himself. We got three verses of that in Matthew 5, 43 through 45. The Lord speaking, you have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was basically the way some people interpreted the Old Testament law. But Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And basically what this is saying is, you treat your enemy the way you would want to be treated. But that doesn't mean that justice won't be gone or won't be done. It doesn't mean you don't want justice. Let God deal with it. This is what this is saying. You still treat them fairly. Just because they've wronged you, you don't wrong them. It doesn't mean you can trust them. No. Forgiving doesn't mean you trust them. Depends on the situation. If they come and apologize and they're sincere and they say they're never going to do it again, well, maybe you can begin to trust them again, but they may have to earn your trust. God will make things right. 
put it in his hands. That's what we want to learn to do. We don't have to hate people, not even our enemies. Now we go back to work. That is, we go back to the subject of work. This is taking up several verses. This one takes the next four verses. It's kind of a fun one. Let's pay attention on this one too. Now remember, this is a wise father talking to his son or a wise sage talking to his students or me talking to you, okay? The wise father passes on what he sees in the sluggard and his vineyard. And he asks the audience to look at it. All right, so we have a father who sees a sluggard. That's a lazy person. And we, he sees his vineyard, and it's a mess. And he's going to tell the audience, that's us, to look at it with him. Verse 30, I passed by the field of a sluggard and the vineyard of a man who lacked sense. <laughs> See, this is kind of funny. First of all, he's lazy. That's what a sluggard is. It's a lazy person. It's an older word. We don't use it too often. But I kind of like it because it just sounds like somebody who doesn't do much. He lays around. He sleeps in. Doesn't do a lot. And his vineyard, maybe inherited it, probably did. Maybe his parents passed it on to him or gave it to him. But he doesn't take care of it. It says, and the vineyard of a man who lacks sense. So it's the same person. He's a sluggard. He has a vineyard. And he lacks sense. The word literally in the Hebrew means he lacks heart. He's not much of a thinker. He doesn't have much sense. Okay? Now let's look at his field. Verse 31. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with weeds. And its stone wall was broken down. So he hasn't been out there pulling weeds. He hasn't been properly caring for his vineyard. He's got thorns. And weeds, uh, maybe thorns among his vineyards and weeds on the ground around it. And the stone walls broken down. Stone walls were put up for protection, maybe from animals or to set up a boundary or both. And it's all broken down too. Maybe someone's attacked it and or went after his vineyard and just got what they wanted. And he just gave up and left it alone, neglected it. And anyway, anyway the whole field is neglected now. Major signs of neglect. So, back to the sage, what's he see? Then I saw, I considered it, I looked, and received instruction. This tells us that the wise father or sage looks at the situation. He sees the sluggard. He sees he lacks sense. He sees that his vineyard is a mess. So he's thinking about it. He's what we call doing some critical thinking about it, or he's analyzing the situation like a detective might to find out who the criminal is. He looks over the evidence. Well, he's got a mess for a field. He's lazy. How did the field get neglected? Because he's lazy. That's pretty easy, isn't it? So it says here in the second line, I looked and received instruction. Now, this in itself is a lesson. We want to observe people. We want to observe things. If you ever want to make a friend with somebody, before you say he's my best friend or she's my best friend, you better do some observation. You better do some listening and make sure their values are the same as yours, or at least most of them are. They, too, believe in honest speech, right? Obeying their parents and not being a little criminal, all right? But the father here has drawn some conclusions about this farmer. Here's what he's going to say. Here's the lesson he's learned. Verse 33. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Now this continues on. Let's go on with it. So let me read it again. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a vagrant and your lack like an armed man. So here's what he's learned from looking at this person. He's lazy. He sleeps in. Uh, 
It's what we call slumber. He lays around. Oh, I don't want to get up. Oh, close those curtains. Okay. When it says he folds his hands, folds his hands, it means that he doesn't want to use his hands. So he's very lazy. Now we've studied this exact two verses back in 6:10 through 11. So we're going to draw on a lot of that information. No sense in going over it again, but it's there and we'll add a little bit more. But basically says this man doesn't want to work. All right. That's why he feels neglected. He lacks sense. He's lazy. He's a sluggard. So it all makes sense. Didn't take long to figure that one out. Now this second line is interesting because it makes poverty as if it's a person. What do we call that? It's personified. And poverty will come upon him like a vagrant. It's like poverty will overcome him like a vagrant. Now what's a vagrant? Well, a vagrant is those people who you'll see sometimes are out on the streets asking for money, pushing a basket, uh, sleeping on the sidewalk, maybe under a bridge. Uh, if you've ever seen them, maybe you haven't. Depends on where you live. But uh, we see them often uh, in the city where I live, in the smaller cities too. Uh, and they will move from place to place. That's what a vagrant is he's a person who will move from place to place. He'll work this area, then he'll go work another area. That is, when I say work, I mean asking for money, asking for food, asking for a handout. Now, this poverty is a certain kind of poverty. This is the poverty that comes on a person who is what we've been studying. He sleeps in. He doesn't work. He is a sluggard, and he lacks sense. So how did this poverty come on this person? He did it himself by not wanting to work, by being lazy. And suddenly, it's like this whole idea of being a vagrant came upon him. I'm going to do this the rest of my life. I want to be a bum. There's all sorts of names for these people panhandler, bum. Back in the days, they used to ride trains. They called them hobos. Uh, I've met some of these people. I've talked to some of these people. And uh, they're, pretty messed, they're pretty messed up. And they choose to be that way. They don't want to work. They don't want to stay in one place. They just want to keep moving. And people bring them food. Or they can go to a shelter and get a shelter or get cleaned up. But that's their lifestyle. But understand, this person who's poor chose to be poor. I call that, let's give you a big long word here. We have a term called legitimate. That means it's someone uh, who is, or it's something that is right, okay. If it's not right, we call it illegitimate, all right? Now, there are some people who are poor, not of their own choosing. When a mother with children loses her husband, she can find herself poor because the main source of her income, her husband has died. If he didn't have any good insurance, she may be poor right away. She may have to sell the house and move to a poor neighborhood, get a job herself, or try to raise the children, and that's very hard. Or maybe someone gets hurt really bad and they can't work. Now today in many countries they have uh, government has systems to help these people. That's fine. These are the type of people we are to help too. We've studied those recently in other books. But these are people who are legitimate. All right. These are people who did not choose to be poor. All right. So they have a perfect excuse. Then there are those who are illegitimate. The illegitimate poor. Just as we defined it. They choose to be poor. They do not want to work. So they have no excuse. They're not hurt. 
They're not sick. They're not widows, but they choose to be poor. And that's what we're talking about here. When you choose this kind of poverty, vagrancy will come upon you. Pretty soon you'll be bumming off everybody. And you'll be standing in front of supermarkets hoping people give you money until the manager runs you off. Or standing on street corners with a sign that says, please help, because you don't want to work. There's all sorts of agencies and shelters in countries like the United States you can go to. Even some cities uh, sound like they like people like that until they get too many, then they want to shut it down. And this is not good. These people need to go to work. All right? So this is what this saying. You, you choose your own poverty, you'll become a vagrant. It'll come up on you like nothing else. Look at the second line. This is, a, this is very serious at this point. Your lack, like an armed man. That's, the lack is equivalent to poverty. You don't have things that you need. It can come on you violently. Suddenly, not only are you an easy target for someone who has something to arm themselves with, it may be a club, maybe a gun or a knife, and they threaten you as you're out there living in your tent. You're pretty weak. So you decide, I'm going to be like him. I'm going to get my own club, and I'm going to go around, and I'm going to prey on people. I'm going to wait till I see a woman alone in the corner over there, and I'm going to go after her or a child, or an old person. So you become a criminal. That's right. Why? Because you say, well, i got to eat, and that person's got stuff I want, so I'm going to take it from them. Do you understand how wrong that is? And that stems, what I mean by that, it comes from being lazy, from being a sluggard, from sleeping in, from losing everything. And you choose, this is a person who chooses to be poor. Now, as you grow older, you're going to have to discern, is this a legitimate poor person or, per, or a poor person who is illegitimate? In other words, they choose to be poor. Often people, like we're seeing right here at the end in verse 34, they want to blame others for their poverty. So they want to blame, well, he's got all that money and I can't get a job. He never really tried to get a job. Yeah, but he's got a good education. He says, I decided not, I wasn't going to study when I was in school. So that goes back to not following the pattern that God gave mankind, right? That we already studied at the beginning of this lesson. You work out in the fields, you build up a, enough money to get a home. You get a home, you start a family, you, and it just goes on from there, right? And you live prosperous. And you're blessed because you have followed God's system. This person has went against all of that. He don't even want to work. So all he's done is create himself a problem and he becomes a problem for society. Because now he wants to prey on people. Now, let me just add this. There are some who have very little wisdom who want to join this poor person and say, well, yes, you're a victim. You're a victim of the people who have worked hard and who are rich. No, he's his own victim. In fact, the people who attack people who actually work hard, they help this poor person think that he's doing the right thing. So they end up supporting the poor person. It gets kind of complicated, but... Just understand the simple principles. You don't want to support the illegitimate poor, but we do want to help the legitimate poor. A simple pattern was given to us at the beginning. As a young person, you want to get training, you want to get a job, you want to get established in life, you want to get set up in life, and your parents can help you as much as they want and you think it's okay to do it. And then you start a family, you get out on your own. You don't violate the rules. You don't get ahead of uh, marriage and have sex before marriage. You don't get in debt, uh, tremendous debt, just to have something. You make sure you're financially set up. If you need to borrow money to buy a car, which is pretty common today, 
make sure you have a job to pay for that loan or that house or that apartment. So you get yourself established. And this is really just common sense. This is not lacking sense. This is having sense, you see. So understand, God has these rules for society. He has them for us to live by. And we want to do that. Well, that wraps up our lesson today, and we'll continue here next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, it's been one of those lessons that has so many things that we can uh, see as valuable in learning and applying. And we ask that as we live our lives in the power of the Spirit, that we'll make the right, ap right applications, be discerning, and give you the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.